Hello everyone, thank you for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for The Mindful Caregiver, Why Self-Care Really Matters, presented by Nancy Chrisman. This webinar is open to caregivers and professionals. CEUs are available through the Board of Behavioral Sciences. In order to obtain your continuing education credit, please email me at aduguy at caregiver.org with your name and your license number or other ID number. I am AJ Duguy, the Education Coordinator for Family Caregiver Alliance. Let me give you a little background on our organization. For over 35 years, we have been working through the Bay Area and across the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers that are providing long-term care. We offer support through educational classes, workshops, fact sheets, retreats, caregiver support services, research, caregiver, caregiver advocacy, and more. For more information, please visit us at www.caregiver.org. For the duration of the presentation, your phones will be muted. If you have any questions, you may ask them throughout by going to the GoToWebinar question box on your screen. These questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. After the completion of this webinar, you will be directed to a survey. Your feedback is very important to us in shaping our future, future education programs, so we would like to thank you in advance for filling those out. Today's speaker is Nancy Chrisman. Nancy is a LCSW and has worked with older people and their families for over 30 years. Nancy is currently in private practice and presents workshops on caregiving and dementia across the country. She has published two books, The Mindful Caregiver, Finding Ease in the Caregiving Journey, re just released February 2014 through Roman and Littlefield Publishers, and The Caring Spirit Approach to Elder Care, a training guide for professionals and families, which was published in 2005 through the Health Professions Press. Nancy has a master's in social work and specialist in a aging degree from the University of Michigan. She has her BA in psychology from the University of Florida and without further ado I'll turn things over to Nancy. Thank you so much AJ and um, I'm really grateful that um, whoever's on this webinar today is on it with me and, um, and also that um, you're giving yourself the time um, to do this because I think one of the biggest challenges that most um, people that are trying to care for folks is time and there never seems to be enough of it and it certainly there doesn't seem to be enough time for yourself. Um, so that's what my whole focus is, is on trying to help caregivers recognize that there are various ways to, to take better care of yourself that don't take a real lot of time and there are also ways to help yourself so that you can actually have more time um, by letting go of some of the things that you think you have to do. So um, if you see the first slide, um, this is something that I think is extremely important um, to talk with caregivers about, and we will get into this in a little bit. And it says, the biggest risk in our daily life is neither stress nor burnout, but numb out. And I'm going to talk with you um, about why numb out is such a powerful and um, really very devastating thing for caregivers if, if they um, don't pay attention to it enough. So let's kind of go through um, relatively quickly what the barriers to self-care are because my guess is, um, you know, I do a lot of workshops for family caregivers and for professionals and um, I've noticed that these are things that Generally, caregivers don't have any trouble coming up with, you know, the reasons that they don't take good care of themselves. And the, the primary thing that I hear over and over and over from caregivers is that they believe they have to do it all. And, and this is really in, in relationship to family caregivers in particular. Um, they don't want to be seen as selfish. And unfortunately, what often can happen is that you can become selfless meaning that you're spending so much effort and time and energy caring for the care recipient 
that you're not paying any attention to your own self and your own life. Um, a lot of people that go into the caregiving field in general, we, we tend to be over-functioners. You know, we're, we're people that like to sort of be in control and take control and take charge. And oftentimes, um, you can have difficulty with saying no. And I'm going to talk a lot today about we and they and they and we, because in all honestly, honesty, most of us at some point in our lives, if we live long enough, are going to need to have somebody taking care of us too. So the first thing I, I talk with caregivers about um, is that so often you want to do what's right. You know, you're trying to sit there figuring out how do I make a good right decision. And what I've recognized in coaching and working with uh, family caregivers and even professionals is that really what you want to get to is best. And um, so I, I grabbed this um, quote from um, the Four Agreements book. Um, and he says, always do your best, no more and no less. You know, best gives you opportunity. It gives you um, an opening so that you can still make some decisions instead of getting caught in right. You have to do it perfect. You have to do it right. Another barrier to self-care is that your own guilt and worry get in the way. And I can tell you that um, I, I personally experienced that myself when I was having to um, decide on what to do with my own mom, who was diagnosed at the age of 71 with Alzheimer's. And um, you know, I felt almost triple pressure because here I am, her daughter, I'm a professional, and I'm the only daughter in the family. And you know, I should be, you know, I always say to people, thou shalt not should on thyself, um, that I should be able to handle this and take care of mom and all that. And so you know, you, oftentimes you get blocked by your, your guilt or your worry or your should. You don't want to hurt other people. Um, families have certain expectations of who should be the caregiver in the family. And then, you know, our culture itself um, really um, has expectations of how we should be providing care to people. Um, and typically, the, the stats are still showing that close to 80% of caregivers are women. Sometimes we're just um, in denial. You know, we're, we're not even aware um, as a caregiver how exhausted, worn out we are. Um, hence, we become numbed out. And what's scary about that is that when you become numbed out, you continue to provide care, but you're kind of going through the motions, and you're not really stepping back and examining, you know, is this what I should be doing here? Can, can I set some limits? You know, can I learn to say no? You know, you just keep on pushing through it all. And that is the scary part um, for caregivers when they kind of numb out. And setting limits and boundaries is a part of good self-care. Um, there's nobody that can, I mean, we have to have limits and boundaries. We have them all over the place in our lives. And then another barrier that I hear constantly from caregivers is that there's not enough time. And of course, there really never is enough time. You know, when you, even when you retire, you're going to find that you've, you're busy doing things. So time really shouldn't be the reason that you don't take care of yourself. It has more to do with valuing yourself, setting priorities, and making sure that you factor in some taking care of yourself time each day. And we can talk through that in, in a little while. Um, and then there's a lot of caregivers that they don't want to admit that they need help or they don't know how to ask for it. And people don't know what you need unless you tell them what you need. The problem that I see sometimes with caregivers is that they're so exhausted and sort of numbed out that they don't even know what they need. So, which is why the Mindful Caregiver, why I wrote the book, because part of the first half of it talks about the importance of getting in touch with yourself as soon as you can so that you can be aware of what you do need help with um, and where you're struggling. And then there are certain caregivers that I've bumped into over the years that really believe that they are resilient and that nothing's going to harm them. They're going to just keep on keeping on, and they're going to be fine. And yet, if you look at the caregiver research out there, it's showing that too many caregivers are being diagnosed with anxiety and stress and depression and physical um, problems due to caregiving. 
And as we get older, we're not as resilient as we were when we were in our 20s. So being a caregiver is not a one-size-fits-all. And what's super important is that everybody has to travel this path their own way. You know, people will ask me all the time, well, Nancy, you know, what's the best way to be a caregiver? And I say, well, it's going to depend on a lot of things. So there's a lot of issues that you need to be paying atten attention to in terms of your role. For example, how did you enter into the role? You know, did you just kind of get slammed one day, your mother falls, breaks a hip, and now you're a caregiver? You know, or did you sit down with your family and talk it out a bit and say, okay, um, you're going to do this and I'm going to do that? You know, oftentimes that's not the way it happens. I mean, people usually get thrown into the caregiver role, unfortunately. And then your past and present relationship with the person that you're going to have to take care of really makes a difference. Your own personality, the personality of the person that you're caring for, and your current situation at large. I mean, you know, what kind of support do you have? Um, the support. What financial of resources are available to you. And then caregivers often forget that their own health matters as well. And you know, I, I'm, I'm reminded, unfortunately, of a situation that I'm dealing with right now in which the caregiver in her early 70s had a heart condition, was not taking care of herself. She wasn't going to the doctor and such. And um, her husband, who had um, a chronic disease that included um, dementia as well, she was spending all her time caring for him, and then all of a sudden she starts having heart pain, goes into the hospital to get it checked, and she's having quadruple bypass surgery. So, you know, our own health and, and paying attention to our age and how we're taking care of ourselves really matters. And then, of course, the, the health of the care recipient, you know, how realistic is it? I mean, bottom line is when people are reaching into their 70s and 80s or even 60s and you're caring for somebody, it's very different from caring for a, a young infant. When you're lifting somebody that's an adult and trying to get them on or off a toilet or, or in, in and out of a bed, it's very different than putting down an infant or helping you know, take care of a, a small person. So, you know, I hear this so much from spouses, and spouses have a spouses partners have a very different type of caregiving relationship than adult children have, and it's real important to, to be aware of that. Um, you know, many of the caregivers that are spouses and partners um, stage of the game, many of them are what are called a traditionist, and they were born before 1945. And they really have a different sort of ethic and morality to, to how they um, expect to care for somebody and what's expected of, of them. And so many times I'm, I hear this from family members that are um, spouses, you know, I feel like my wife's illness is killing me. I love her, but how do I take care of her and take care of me? So understanding these differences. Um, the generational differences, the lack of physical energy that you have when you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the d dreaded decision. I mean, there is nobody that really can make the decision for you except yourself when it comes to d deciding when to move a spouse. Um, and it's a hard one. It really is. And it, it's, it's helpful to have other people weighing in on the decision but ultimately, as one caregiver said to me, it all falls on me, and, and that I do know is true. Uh, adjusting to the huge changes in the relationship, that's a really big difference from family caregivers. When you've had an intimate relationship with somebody for all these years, and many people that are from the traditionalist generation have been married for 40, 50, 60 years. And then all of a sudden, you've got somebody with dementia or Parkinson's, and, and they're just not able to to relate to you as a, a spouse or a partner. So that change in intimacy is really a, makes a very big difference for folks. And then for the adult children, you know, how do I respect my mother's wishes to be independent and at the same time I see her on a path to self-destruction? You know, a lot of older people will share with me that they feel like their children are taking over and are trying to control their lives and don't think aren't respectful to them. And really, that's not what most adult children would say. 
what they would say is, I'm scared to death. I don't really know how to do this. Um, I'm seeing that my parent is or my family member is becoming more frail. I want to honor their independence and their ability to be control of their life. However, there are times when it gets a little bit challenging because of the type of illness they have. Um, with adult children, there's what we call role reversals or role changes. And what I like to say is role changes because role reversal kind of says that the person that you're caring for becomes sort of the child and you become sort of the adult. That's how people sort of look at that. And, and yet really what's happening, when I thought about my mom, she was losing more of her independence and her ability to take care of herself. She was still my mom. And I didn't see her as a child. To me, if I had seen her as a child and sort of related to her that way, it would be more, I think, demeaning to her. Um, the decision making is very tough for adult children, like I said a few minutes ago. You know, when do you step in and take over? I mean, that's a really tough. And then what do you do if you've got the well spouse who's in denial and doesn't want to see that he or she cannot take care of their spouse, and you know, when does the adult child take it over and say, hey, dad, you know, you're not taking care of mom. Um, you really need some help. And then there's the issues of competency. And you know, one of the things that I tend to say to families is that when you have a family member who is competent, in other words, maybe making some poor choices, but they really do have their competency, they don't have cognitive impairment, they're not severely depressed. I usually say that people have the right to make poor decisions. I mean, we do every day in our lives. Um, however, when somebody is incompetent, when they are developing, you know, pretty significant dementia and they're not able to make appropriate decisions for themselves, and that's a whole other story. And that does require that the people take over. Sometimes we are so focused on a certain path or goal that we fail to notice that the solution to our problem cannot be found in the path we are so feverishly pursuing. And I think that that's a big issue with adult children and even with spouses, is that you know we want things to be the way they always were. We think that if we've got something set up a certain way, it's going to stay that way. And what I always tell people is that if you think you're on the right path, you're on someone else's. Because by the time you think you've got it all figured out and worked out, things change. And when you're caring for somebody with dementia, things can change very rapidly. I mean, literally, as you, many of you probably know, from minute to minute. And that makes things quite a bit. So flexibility is an incredibly important characteristic for a caregiver. So what I think causes most of the stress, I mean, caregiving, well, there's no that. However, there are some things that caregivers can do to reduce the stress. And I talk about this a lot to my caregivers because I feel like so much of your time gets taken with all the stress that you're dealing with. And if you can reduce some of that stress, so it's those beliefs that you hold that are not always you know, practical or achievable. You know, when you're a company statements by saying, I should be able to do this, I must do that, I have to do, if you catch yourself saying those things, then you might want to step back and say, wait a minute here. You know, how is this keeping me in, in a more stressful situation? And um, because so often these are associated with stress. And the guilt that is often um, associated with this as well can cause stress. And what I say to folks about guilt is that you're always going to have guilt. I mean, there's, you know, guilt in some ways is a very positive thing. And I know that sounds crazy. But you know, when you feel guilty about something, no matter what it is, you know, you're basically saying to yourself, you know, I'm concerned about the situation. It's bothering me. And it, and it helps you to sort of reassess. Where guilt can get to be problematic, particularly for caregivers, is when they let the guilt take over and they're not able to step back 
and say, okay, I feel bad about this, I feel guilty about this, but I know this is what we have to do. This is best for, for everybody involved. So some of the questions that can help you sort of navigate through some of these stressful things that you're putting yourself into here are what I call realistic questions to ask yourself. For example, are you willing to let go of being the super caregiver? And I'm sure if I could sit in front of all of you, you could give me lots of ways um, to define super caregiver, but you know what it is. Um, are you willing to ask for support when you need it? And so often, again, people don't want to bother people. I hear that all the time from my spouses. They'll say, well, my, my kids are really busy. They're doing all kinds of things, and they don't have time for me or for my husband or whatever. Um, can you let go of what? that you don't have control over. I mean, you know, one of the things caregiving teaches us is that there's a lot you don't have control over. And then can you admit that you have limitations? Um, you know, best example I can give you was when my father, um, about 15 years ago, was living with my stepmom, and she wanted to go away for the weekend and did not tell me that my father was incontinent. And um, I found out through talking to somebody else, and I had said I would go and visit and stay with him. But I really was very, very uncomfortable with the idea of having to um, toilet him. And, you know, other adult daughters or other children might not have any problem with that at all. And yet that was a limitation that I felt I had and I needed to hold to and I had to come up with a different solution. So. Um, Instead of pushing myself to do something that was very uncomfortable and, you know, potentially harmful to myself and my dad, you know, learning how to set those limits and admit that you have them, that you have some limitations, and, and then making the commitment um, to take care of yourself um, is, a, is a question you need to ask yourself. Are you realistic about, at who you can depend on for support? Um, Again, a lot of caregivers say, well, you know, I think my brother, he should help out, or my sister, or whatever. And what I've learned is that, again, the shoulds are getting in the way. Um, yes, it would be wonderful um, if, if they could help out, but not always are, there gonna, are they going to want to or be able to. That doesn't mean we have to take it all on. What it means is that we're going to have to realistically say, okay, my brother's not going to be able to help me, so where else am I going to find some support and help? Um, are you willing to accept that there are certain circumstances that you're going to have to choose your battles? And again, those people who have grown up with, you know, raised children know what I'm talking about when it comes to choosing battles. I mean, you can sit there and pick on every little thing and drive yourself crazy or you can step back again as a mindful caregiver and say, okay, wait a minute here. Now, what's really the most important? You know, how important is it that, that I get my mother's hair in, in perfect shape, the way she always loved it, you know, when she's fighting me and won't allow me to do it, versus making sure that she's getting her medications, that she's eating properly, that, you know, she's getting her rest. I mean, we have to learn, you know, which battles to, to choose there. And... Um, and then recognizing that sometimes there won't be reconciliation, that there are going to be situations that, um, in which you're just going to have to, you know, instead of stressing yourself out and, and, and hoping that things are going to be different, just to recognize that this is how it is. You know, the young people are real good at saying, it is what it is. And sometimes I think they're kind of right about that. Um, and then the whole business of unfinished business, which means that, you know, there are going to be circumstances in which you wished that you had a better relationship with the person you're caring for or maybe with one of the family members in your life. And sometimes you, you, you just can't always make those situations work out in, in the best way. I'm not saying that you don't try because I think it's always important to, to do your best to, to reach out but it doesn't always turn out the way you would exactly like it to be. So being a mindful caregiver requires paying attention to how caregiving impacts you. You know, to be able to, to take two minutes of your day and check in with yourself and say, okay, how exhausted do I feel right now? What's, what's going on in my body? You know, um, 
am I feeling it in my back? Am I feeling it in my neck? Am I feeling it in my head? Am I noticing that I don't have an appetite? Noticing and paying attention is extremely important because once you're able to get you know, into that sort of mindset, then you can begin to say, okay, what am I going to do about this? Maybe my back and, and my neck and my head's hurting me because I cannot lift my husband or wife, you know, the way I'm doing. It's not working for me. It's not working for my body. And we have to come up with strategies and ways to get some additional support. Another thing that can cause incredible stress for, for caregivers is just this emotional roller coaster that you're on. And, um, and I think some of it has to do with our culture. Our culture says that we should take care of people. It's our duty. And even when we didn't have great relationships or you know, whatever, it, it's what we're supposed to do. And we're not supposed to really feel how, how we really feel. So for example, if we really feel angry or resentful or frustrated, you know, caregivers so often will say to me in a very quiet voice, they'll say, Nancy, sometimes I'd just like to kill my husband or I wish he was dead, or I'm just so frustrated I can't stand it anymore. And, and instead of being able to voice those things, what, they, what caregivers do to themselves is they drink it away, they eat it away, they may sleep it away. Um, you know, you don't give yourself permission, and you need to be able to own all your feelings. It is normal to be angry and tired and frustrated. I mean, I can... You know, my mom lived with Alzheimer's for 17 years. And prior to that, she had some bipolar illness as well. And so in some ways, I've been caregiving a long time. And I can tell you that there were times, and I wasn't her primary caregiver. Um, she did end up in assisted living in a nursing home, but I was her advocate and, and the person sort of in charge, and the one visiting her and, and making sure everything was going OK. And trust me, there were times when I just wanted to say enough already. In fact, I did say that um, because it's a normal emotion. Um, and to realize, too, that things can change over time with your feeling. You know, um, sometimes you'll be surprised at how things will change with your care recipient and maybe all of a sudden this nasty, mean, difficult person becomes sweet and easy to be with and delightful and funny. Um, and so, you, you know, there's some surprises along the way that come with these emotions. Um, so, so you're going to feel a lot of different things. You're going to feel joy at times, intense love. You know, sometimes when you're giving care to somebody, I mean, especially that intimate, what we call activities of daily living care. I mean, that's a, that is, you can't get any more intimate in many ways if you think about it. You know, feeding somebody, having to toilet somebody. And, you know, if you do it, if you can find a place to do it in, in compassion and, and in, in the spirit of caring, um, you can feel some, some good out of it, too, and even some gratefulness. When it comes to dementia, though, I do think that there's some, some things that caregivers bump up against. <coughs> that is different from caring for other types of, of chronic diseases. And the reason I say that is that it's in this quote that I talk about, living with someone with dementia feels like you're living with someone who is only partially available. And, and that is a very, I mean, ambivalence is one of the most difficult things for anybody to have to cope with. Um, the ambiguity of not knowing how your family member is going to be from day to day. I, I'd go visit my mother a couple times a week at the nursing home, and there'd be times when I'd go, and she'd be delightful and funny, and you know we just had a great time. And then other times she would be nasty and throw her coffee at me, or call me names, or tell me to get the hell out of there. Excuse my French. You know, just things like that that just took me by surprise because it was so not like my mom. It was so much more her dementia speaking. But that ambiguity where there's, you know, you just don't know from day to day, you know, feels terrible for a spouse to go visit somebody or be with somebody and they don't remember that you're their, you're their wife or husband. Um, 
And so ambiguity and ambiguous loss is a loss that's unclear, has no resolution and no closure, which is why we sometimes talk about um, Alzheimer's in particular is, is the 36-hour day or the, the funeral that never ends because it just seems like it goes on for a long, long time. And when people are absent and then present, it, it, it's hard to shift gears. I mean, and, and that's another reason why caregivers have a hard time making decisions because, you know, one minute your mother seems to be, she can't remember to turn the stove off and she's not eating properly and she's letting in strangers. And then you'll go visit her and she seems to be with it, you know. And so how do you, you know, your heart just sort of wrenches with, you know, how do I make a decision to place my mom, let's say, in an assisted living or bring in a caregiver when she has these good days? So I think that if, if, if caregivers can acknowledge that one of the things about dementia is that it causes ambiguity, that in itself will lessen the stress because then you, you, know, you can say to yourself, well, I'm not really crazy. This is a difficult thing to have to go through. And, um, and I think it's important for adult children and spouses to recognize the differences. Um, when it comes to this ambiguous loss. Um, and, and let me give an example. Recently, I was consulting um, with a family, and they were very upset because their mom actually was in a memory care and um, community, and the husband w would visit her, and he would get extremely upset and, de and very demanding because he'd come to, on the unit, and his wife would be holding hands with another man. And then he would come there and he'd grab her hand away from the man and take her and yell at her and tell her, you know, that's not right. And, and the family was very disturbed because he, it was hard for them to help him understand that she probably thought this man she was holding hands with was her husband. And it's that kind of ambiguity and loss that people in particular um, deal with with dementia. So, now I want to sort of get into the crux of this whole thing around self-care, and that's mindfulness. And, you know, you hear the term mindfulness all the time nowadays, and um, they're using mindfulness techniques with, in businesses, they're using it with children, and certainly with lots of different types of chronic diseases for people. And, and I thought to myself, you know, I think there's some good things that we can be doing with mindfulness with, with caregivers as well. Because what mindfulness does is it brings self-awareness into focus. It reminds you that you matter too. And you know, one of the things I talk about uh, um, quite a bit with family caregivers is that I don't want you to take care of yourself only so that you'll be a better caregiver. I want you to take care of yourself because you matter. Because you as a person matter. You know, you could be caregiving for 20 years or 15 years, and it, it's really about making sure you keep up with some of your life, because that's a long time to, to lose yourself and, and, and lose your, your connections with people. So mindfulness, and I'm going to, you know, kind of go through this relatively quickly, because I know that a lot of people know about it, um, but mindfulness is being in the present and trying to do it in a non-judgmental way, knowing that, especially with dementia, every day, every moment is going to be different. And it means slowing yourself down and connecting to your heart. When, you're, when you keep yourself busy, when you keep doing, you're disconnected from your heart. And when you're disconnected from your heart, I believe that you can't fully experience your life around you and, and the people around you. And, you know, some of the blessings that my mother's disease kind of provided for the two of us, there were many. You know, I could look at it and say, oh, yeah, there were some pretty crummy things that came out of this as well. But there were some wonderful blessings. And one of them was that mom and I made me slow down because she couldn't move as fast. She couldn't think as fast. She didn't get a lot of words out. And it at one point, she couldn't even talk. And yet, what it helped me was to just connect with her differently from my heart. 
and I'll, and I'll never forget how powerful that experience was for both of us. Mindfulness embraces the qualities of compassion and kindness and patience, and it's an approach that everybody can use. Um, it helps you to be more intentional, because I think that, again, so often many of us kind of go through our lives a little bit unconscious, you know, like even paying attention to the birds and the, and the snow and the, you know, just all the things that are around us. You know, we, we forget about that stuff because we get so consumed with the task at hand. And what mindfulness does is, is again, it says to you, wait a minute here. You've got to pause. You've got to take a step back. You've got to breathe. You've got to, you know, do a better job of checking in with you. And what I think is so incredibly valuable about mindfulness is that it teaches you how to be compassionate towards yourself because I'll tell you it blows me away how caregivers are so impatient with themselves. I mean they can be incredibly patient with the care recipient and yet they get frustrated with themselves quickly, they don't take good care of themselves because they, they get impatient with themselves um, they, you know, many of these things that you see up on the screen here, I know that I should take better care of myself, but I don't have time. I have to focus on him. I can't let anyone else take care of my mother. He won't let anybody else do it. My situation is impossible. Those are all really demeaning ways of talking to yourself. Um, because if you have compassion, what you would say is, I do need to take better care of myself. I will find the time to do that. I don't have to always focus only on him. I can let somebody else take care of my mom. He can deal with somebody else taking care of him. And my situation at the very moment might feel impossible, but it's not. Each moment changes, and it can get better. So. Self-care is not an option, it's a necessity. To care for another, you must care for yourself. And, um, you know, you're going to hear this over and over and over because it's, it, you just can't give the attention to yourself if you don't take care of yourself. You can't give it to anybody else, including your, your children and your grandchildren and your spouse and, you know, the people that are in your life. So a mindful caregiver pays attention to how caregiving impacting you. You become aware of your emotion. You tune into your body. And another thing that I have found to be extremely important is you be, become more aware of your spirit. And what I mean by the spirit is it's that place inside of you that connects to your soul and your heart. It, not the brain telling you how you should be. It's allowing you to, to be who you are. And most of us really don't do such a good job at taking care of our spirit. And it's so easy to do. You know, um, there are so many people that you come, you know, you, you meet in your life that have joyful spirits, that make you laugh that make you feel good about yourself. There are activities, again, that help fill your spirit, and um, music, and dancing, and all those sorts of things. And if caregivers don't pay any attention to the spirit side of themselves, then even if they get a grip on their emotions, they're still depleted. Um, that heart and the soul have to be filled. So being a mindful caregiver, also says to yourself, hey, wait a minute, what am I saying to me? You know, how, what messages am I giving myself? Am I being willing to be open? Am I looking at the fact that, no, this is not going to go away, but I can find some balance and some ease? And it starts with recognizing that you also cannot be responsible for all the care. And, and quite frankly, what I often tell people 
is that if you think you're the only person that can take care of your husband or your mother or your sibling, in some ways that's selfish. And the reason I say that is that I found that when I was able to get a circle of support around my mom, in other words, when I brought in some people from our faith that would come and visit her, when I encouraged relationships at the nursing home she was living at, so that people actually enjoyed being with her and, you know, and got to know my mom, then she had so many more loving people around her than just me. So it's really important to think about that piece of it, that real, most likely your care recipient is going to do better when there are more people around him or her. And then the mindful caregiver recognizes the spirit side of caring, which is what I just was talking about. Um, that, and that is the piece that I see when, my, when caregivers come to my workshops or in counseling with me, and I start to say to them, now, how are you taking care of your spirit? And they look at me like I'm talking a foreign language. And it takes some time to get in touch with what that means for, them, for each caregiver. And it's because they've put that part of their life aside. So ways to take care of yourself and people you know I start out with rest and people say to me that is a joke Nancy you know you cannot rest when you have somebody that you're taking care of that follows you around the house all day long is constantly asking you the same thing over and over and what I'm talking about is two things one you have to have sleep you have to have uninterrupted sleep and somehow you've got to make that happen and generally there are ways to get respite help for you so that you can get some good night's rest. And then you have to find ways to rest in the day. And some of the ways, you can take a, a five-minute rest, you know, where you just quiet yourself and pause for a minute and say some good things about, you know, this is hard work, but I'm doing the best that I can, you know, and, and giving yourself more positive self-care messages. Uh, meditation is, has been a, a wonderful way for people to, you know, really kind of rejuvenate their spirit and their and their soul and, and, and them physically too. And interestingly, if you do if you Google meditation, you will find that it's not like you have to spend hours and hours meditating you can meditate for 10 minutes. It's a practice, and it is something you have to do on a daily basis in order to get a benefit from it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be for real long. There are even some books um, out, I, I found a couple of them that say 10-minute meditation that can make a world of difference in terms of slowing yourself down, shutting down your monkey mind, rejuvenating your, your spirit, breathing, taking breaths, um, so often people don't breathe very much, and um, that's such an important piece. I mean, when I do caregiver workshops, I'll often say to caregivers, I want you to take three really deep breaths before we even start talking about anything in here. And I tell professional caregivers, before you get into the building of where you're going to care for people, take some deep breaths and maybe even pray. Um, you know, prayer is a very powerful, in fact, I, I pray with my mom, you know, when my mom would get into these really bad places, and my mother was not very religious, it was amazing, um, I found that on here, she, as she got more into her dementia, she sort of forgot that she didn't care so much tab, about her religion, and, <laughs> and she kind of came back to the like place of that way wanting know what to, to have that. God in her life. No and um, so it was so very, very I'm productive sad. and helpful to her and soothing and to be able to pray to God when she was feeling scared or upset. Um, it really made a major difference. Humor and laughter. What I tell family caregivers, and even professionals too, of course, is that you know there's enough junk on television, there's enough really nasty things out there. A lot of us now can tape, record things, you know, get on, get on your TV and look for positive, funny things. I mean, I, to this day, I still love Lucille Ball, which my mother introduced me to, um, or the Golden Girls, or just anything 
funny um, that you can relate to that will make you laugh and go to sleep laughing because you know it to, to go to bed stressed out so find movies that are funny um, there's so much out there be around people that make you laugh and this is a mindful caregiver intentionally looks at the people in their life and says who makes me laugh who fills me with joy and who depletes me because if you're around people that are depleting you, you're already depleted by being a caregiver. You don't need to have people around you that are going to deplete you more. Get that circle of support. You know, sit with yourself and say, okay, who can I call upon? And, 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 and really, you know, go for it. I mean, you know, don't, don't judge it right away and say, no, if I ask this person, they're not going to do it. If I ask this person, I mean, try to be open to that. And then I talk about um, positive comfort. You know, find things instead of going to, you know, drinking and eating and um, overdoing things. You know, look at the things that can pr provide you positive soothing, positive comfort. It might be gardening. It might be, you know, watching something funny, taking a bath, you know, um, being with a friend that, that makes you laugh, um, dancing. You know, and, and again, 10 minutes. Five minutes of this kind of stuff can make such a difference for people. So I'm going to end by saying that um, caregivers, you, I know you can find ease in the caregiving journey. I know you can. And it's really a matter of your willingness to try some different things, to get in touch with what you think your role can realistically be, Ask yourself some of the questions that I walked you through earlier in the webinar, and um, and, and enlist the support of others. I mean, you know, we talk a lot about you can't. Um, what is it? It takes a village to raise a child. Well, it also takes a village to care for an older person. It really, really does. And um, I think too many caregivers get caught up in believing that they they are the only person that can do this job. Um, so, and, and I think, too, that there's a little bit of guilt that you feel if you do take care of yourself. You know, our culture really values overworking. And, I mean, look what we're doing now to ourselves. I mean, we're connected to our cell phones and every other gadget 24-7. And so, you know, I find that I now tell caregivers, this is how I take care of myself. I'm not working on the weekend unless it's a real emergency. I'm going to take my vacation. Um, and, you know, caregivers are really bad about taking time off. You know, well, they often will say, well, if I do that, you know, I'm, I'm just coming back to the same old thing. And I'm saying to you, yes, that might be the case. But when you get some downtime, you can regroup, rejuvenate, and you can take a, a look at maybe how you could do things differently. So, AJ, I'm going to open it up for some questions. Okay, thank okay, you so, thank you much, so Nancy, much, Nancy, for sharing, for that, sharing thoughtful that thoughtful perspective. perspective. It's always great, it's to, always have great to have a speaker that has that had has both had professional, professional and personal, and personal experience, experience with caregiving. With caregiving. So, thank so thank you. And we just and we just and we have just and a few questions, just a few questions for, you. for you. The first okay. one the first is how do I find the time to take care of myself when so much time is spent taking care of my loved my loved one? Okay. So first of all, the first thing that a mindful caregiver does is says to yourself, I matter, and I am going to have to find the time, and I can find the time, because there are some things that I can do to decrease the amount of time I'm, I'm spending caregiving. And so it may be something like, you know, I'm going to look at having my family member go to a day program or I'm going to invite some of my friends to come and spend an hour or two with my family member so that I can have some, some taking care of myself time. Or I'm going to, before I get up in the morning, I'm going to take 10 minutes to meditate. Or during the day, I'm going to take five minutes, you know, three or four times a day to take a really deep three breaths, breathe it in, breathe it out, or I'm going to listen to some music that, that will hopefully shift my, my attitude. And, and quite frankly, listening to music with, 
with your care recipient can be incredibly rejuvenating. It can absolutely help you feel more at ease, and it's very soothing. So there's never going to be enough time if that's what you believe. And one of the things I talk about in my book is entrenched caregiver beliefs. I mean, the beliefs that you hold on to, like there's never enough time or I'm the only one, you know, some of the things that, that I talked about earlier. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have one more question that was just sent in. One second. It says, how do you deal with the conflict of the spouse not seeing that she needs help, but the adult child seeing that they need help? What suggestions would you have for the adult child? That's a fabulous question, and I get it get asked it all the time. And, it, and I wish, you know, one of the things that I want to say to caregivers is this to start with. Number one, I wish I could say to you, here's a pill. Give this to your, your mother or father, and, and everything's going to change. Or give this to your sibling, and all of a sudden you'll, you'll have a happy, you know, family. There, there isn't a pill. There isn't a magic formula. However, there are some things you can do with spouses in particular when you've got um, that traditionalist generation of people who very strongly believed in the motto, in sickness and health, to death do us part. And, um, and so part of it is that they're often in a, in a space where, number one, they may be numbed out to the point where they're so tired that they're not even realizing how much help they need. And then secondly, they're coming from that framework of I'm supposed to, you know, I should take care of. And sometimes they also feel that it's their job, their responsibility, they can only do it the right way and the best way. And so you've got to start where they are. And, and so when your parent um, who's really not doing the best job of taking care of their husband or wife, um, what you may want to start with is saying to them, you know, mom or dad, um, I'm amazed that you've been able to care for, for dad as, as long as you have. I mean, it's really incredible. And, um, you know, but the thing is, is that um, you can't do this, you know, nonstop, and yet I know that you feel that this is your job. And, and so I want you to, to, to be aware that you know, our family is truly grateful that you've been able to do all that you can, um, but we wondered if you could come up with some ideas of who else could maybe step in um, when you can't. And the thing is, what a lot of the spouses tell me is that they feel trampled over sometimes, that their children are trying to take away their jobs, and they feel like they don't they want to be in control. So we've got to think of ways to validate what they're doing and at the same time say to them, look at, can you come up with some ideas? And if they say, well, there's nobody that can do this the way I can, then, you know, what you're going to have to do is, is determine as a mindful caregiver, is safety an issue here? So, for example, if the care recipient is not being taken care of properly, in other words, they're, they're not getting, let's say, they're incontinent and they're not changing their depend, um, so they could have skin breakdown or they're not getting proper meals. When safety becomes an issue, then you usually have to bring in a professional and because it's very hard for families um, to try to do that on their own completely. Now, if, if their safety is not an issue um, and, and, and neither person, the spouse or the ill spouse, is in harm's way, and people have a right to, to, to do what they want to do, you know. And, um, I mean, I, I look at my stepmother when she was caring for my father, and she was very adamant that she was the one and all that. And, um, you know, what we had to do is just do some little things to kind of dance around her so that she, you know, we'd say things like, you know, Phyllis, um, you're doing a great job. Um, how about if, if we hire a taxi cab driver to take dad to some of his um, rehab sessions so you can go to water aerobics. And um, you know, so we'd find little ways to get her at least to do some things for herself. 
Okay, those are some really great suggestions. Thank you, Nancy. And we have time for a few more questions. The next one I have is, how do I let go of my guilt? How do you let go of guilt? Um, I think that, again, our culture is very focused on guilt in some ways. And, you know, some of us, uh, you know, we're all sort of in this, like, Jewish guilt and Catholic guilt and this guilt and that guilt. And, um, and, I, and I do think guilt has, you know, I've said this before in the, in the webinar earlier on, that there is some good things about guilt because guilt does sort of get you in touch with where your limitations are in a way and where you get stuck. And so what I say to people is that what I'd like for you to do is to, is to write down, you know, what do you feel guilty about? I feel guilty that I'm not doing as, enough for my mother or I feel guilty that I'm thinking about moving my mom into an assisted living or I feel guilty that I'm going to have to take the car away. And that as a mindful caregiver, you step back, you get in touch with what your guilt messages are, and then you, you don't make any judgments about them. You say, well, you know, it's okay that I, yeah, I do feel guilty about taking dad's car away, but I've got to now because, you know, he's got dementia and he could really harm somebody or himself. And now I'm going to have to figure out a way to maybe get a doctor to help out or whatever, but I can't let my guilt get in the way of not making sure that my father and people around her are in a safe position. So to me, it's a matter of looking at what you feel guilty about, writing it down, because sometimes putting it on paper can really make a difference, and then talking it through with yourself and, and giving yourself permission to feel guilty. But if you can sit there and say, I'm not making decisions because of my guilt, then you know that the guilt is getting out of control. And that, again, is where you may need to involve either a professional to help you, it could be a counselor, it could be a pastoral person from your church, it might be another friend that can look at it in a different way for you. Um, so guilt is really, a, in some ways, it's a good thing. Thank you, Nancy. I think we have time for one more question, and it's, how do I say no when I know everyone is counting on me? There's a lovely book that, I, that I've referenced in my Mindful Caregiver book um, called Getting to a Positive No. And, um, and I, I think what I say to caregivers is this, and, and this is really true. So much of what we say to caregivers is true for all of us. We all have trouble setting limits. We all have trouble saying no. We certainly didn't have trouble saying no when our kids wanted to do something yet when they were younger, but it's so much harder to say no to an adult for whatever reason. I don't know. Um, I think the reason really is is that we don't want to hurt people's feelings and, um, and, and we don't, you know, and we want to do the best we can and we do let our guilt in the way and so, get in the way. But the thing is, if you say no, if you say yes what, and you really meant no, then you become passive aggressive in a way. You know, if you say yes, I'll go ahead and do this really when you, you don't really want to then what happens is all these little negative feelings creep up in you and it can really cause some anger and, and it actually makes it worse. So getting to a positive no really means saying no when you really mean it, but being prepared to come up with an, another solution. And um, I, I talk about this a lot during holiday time for people because you know, there's a point when you're a caregiver, you only have so much energy. And, you know, and whether or not your family is used to you hosting the Thanksgiving meal at your house, you know, things have got to change when you, you just can't do it all. And so instead of saying, no, I can't have it at my house, you could say, yes, I'll have it at my house. However, I'm making the turkey and everybody else is bringing everything else, you know. Or, no, I can't have it at my house, but let's all go to a restaurant. You know, so there are ways to get to a positive no. Thank you so much. So that's actually all the time we have for questions. So please feel free to call or email us if there are any other questions that we did not cover. Thank you for everyone who participated in The Mindful Caregiver, Why Self-Care Really Matters, presented by Nancy Christman.
Again, you will receive a survey after you exit the webinar, and we would really appreciate your feedback to shape our future educational programs. Please join us next month for our webinar titled Long-Term Care in California, What Is It and Who Pays for It? It's on March 25th from 1 to 2 p.m. Pacific Time, and you can visit our website for more information. Thank you again, Nancy, for joining us. Okay, great. So this web this webinar is now concluded.